Your Royal Highness, a uh, pleasure to have you here. A uh, special welcome to you and to the Minister. Fantastic to have you here as well. And dear friends and um, guests here for this session, this is an affiliate uh, session for uh, the First Mover Coalition. And uh, I'm the, your host today, uh, Martin Lunds, that is my name, and I'm the President and CEO of the Volvo Group. So we are very proud to have almost sold out house. Uh, and what I'm saying that we are also streamlining uh, live and we know that we have a lot of uh, viewers because everyone that is interested in execution is listening into this session. Uh, this session will be about one of the key elements of succeeding in this journey and uh, not at least for the first movie coalition and, and really executing on the value streams that we have decided in steel, in, in aluminium, in trucking, in shipping. Uh, and the different uh, verticals, because uh, that requires uh, cooperation along the value chains. Uh, I was actually telling the, uh, the CEO climate leader uh, uh, steering committee today and the lunch. I was actually surprised that there are still so many companies that have not pledged for scope three yet. Because there is where the magic actually will happen. And that is the reason why we think that the science-based target initiative, together with the First Movie Coalition, are the two key elements for the Volvo Group in making our journey up to a fossil-free company by 2040. Everything that we will deliver by 2040, or products and services globally, shall be fossil-free. And that is a big undertaking, obviously, uh, meaning also that our mature verticals, industrial verticals, need to considerably accelerate uh, uh, in the coming years here. The good news is that we are in serial production now when it comes to battery electric, both medium-duty and heavy-duty trucks. Uh, medium duty since 2019 and, and heavy duty since uh, last year actually and we are ramping up now as we speak. We see customers actually are moving from putting a number of units in front of their head offices to, to say that they have got started to really ramp it up depot by depot. And that requires also of course a lot of uh, co cooperation when it comes to um, uh, infrastructure and logistics uh, 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 cooperation. We have formed in Europe, a cooperation with Daimler and Trayton regarding uh, charging infrastructure, Mylands, uh, arm's length distance uh, as a CPO provider, meaning that everyone can join forces to be an electromobility service provider on that network, 1,700 charging points in Europe, meaning that partnership is the new leadership. Uh, today, we will uh, then talk about a lot of how we actually as uh, companies are inviting our supply chain partners really to make uh, the magic happen. Uh, because uh, innovation will take place uh, together with all those. Uh, and uh, obviously for us that are relatively big and large corporates, it's very important also that we are surfacing uh, the supply opportunities and the su uh, supply availabilities across value chains. Uh, which, by the way, for the First Mover Coalition is the second pillar of key priorities. I mean, the First Mover Coalition is to, about creating demand, uh, and that's the reason why we are pledging in the different verticals. Uh, but the other side, of course, is also to surface uh, the supply opportunities, both when it comes to visibility uh, 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 um, around current capacity, uh, for example, we are uh, in production now, serial production for fossil free steel, and we are buying all the quantities available. Uh, there are not so many hundred tons yet, but uh, they are available, and we are learning as we go. Uh, so, so we have some of the key components, and we are doing the same journey now when it comes to aluminium and trucking. Uh, because we need to also walk the talk, so everything that we do in, in trucking, uh, we, we have to also do in our own inbound and outbound. But we will discuss that more in detail later. Um, so this session is how do we join forces uh, through procurement innovation. We will have Secretary Kerry also coming uh, as the founder of FMC and a strong supporter of what we have been doing. He was also at Stockholm uh, 50 plus and handed over our first articulated dump truck to one of our key customers. That was a great event since we have so, uh, in our book at least, I mean we have been hanging in this industry for a while, cool products. Uh, and a very important part of the solution also because everyone in, in the scope three race will come to logistics and transportation. So by that actually, uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, if you have uh, specific questions, uh, interaction, objections, uh, you know, uh, uh, during the session, feel free. Uh, and in addition to that, obviously, we will hang around afterwards also if you have uh, ideas how we can cooperate. So looking forward for a 
great hour together in decarbonizing different very important value chains. And by that I will introduce Annie, who is the senior advisor to Secretary Kerry, one of the key uh, players and key uh, um, uh, cooperating partners with us to actually lead the first panel, where I happen to participate myself a little bit, but uh, I will leave the word to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So with that, I will call up our fantastic set of panelists. First, Martin, <laughs> who you all know. <laughs> We're so lucky to have. Uh, next, we're going to uh, introduce Henrik Anderson, the president and CEO of Vestas. And finally, we have Steve Varley, the global vice chair for sustainability at EY. So the first thing I want to say from, from Secretary Kerry's office is just a huge thank you to each of you for the work that your companies are doing in joining the First Movers Coalition. I'll, I'll talk about this in a second and actually get to the question, but each one of you has made a discreet, measurable, and, and frankly difficult commitment to decarbonize your supply chains by 2030. And this is you know, exactly what we mean by being a first mover, what you have done, and, and we are hugely thankful. Uh, for the momentum that you are starting and, and the challenges that, that you will be at the front of addressing. Uh, and we hope that many other companies can learn from you and follow in your example. It's going to be absolutely critical to decarbonizing these hard to abate industries that the First Movers Coalition focuses on. So I wanna walk through quickly where each of you have focused and then ask a little bit about the commitments that you've made. So, so first, um, Hen Henrik, Vestas has made a commitment in the steel the steel sector, saying that 10% of the steel that you procure by 2030 will be green steel. Martin, Volvo has made oodles of commitments to the First Movers Coalition. You guys have made a trucking commitment that 30% of your heavy-duty trucks will be uh, electric vehicles or, or non-emitting by 2030, 100% uh, of your light-duty trucks. You've made a aluminum commitment that 10% of the aluminum that you purchase will be green aluminum by 2030, and 10% of the steel that you purchase will be green steel. These are seriously intense commitments. And I want to make it clear, when I'm talking about green products, we're not just saying, oh, it's a little bit better than what's on the market today. We're saying 80, 90% emissions reductions. We have a stringent threshold. These are technologies that are not yet on the market and need to actually scale up. And so you are saying, I know the market doesn't exist. I will buy those things in 2030. And then, and then finally, um, Steve, you have made the commitment uh, at EY to, to aviation, and a firm like EY is flying a huge amount. You're saying that 5% of the flights that you, uh, that you go on will be 85% or greater uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So that is a, a huge commitment as well, 85% sustainable aviation fuel not on the market today. So each one of these, this is not this is not greenwashing. This is not saying this is a high-level commitment. This is a real, discrete, measurable, difficult thing. So the first question I want to pose to each of you is, what made you decide to do this? Some people might think it's crazy or expensive or just not worth the hassle. So I would love to, to just sort of go through the line and hear a little bit about why did you think this was an important place to focus your energy in the coming years? Maybe we can start with you. Sure. Well, uh, firstly, thank you to Martin and Volvo Group for the invitation alongside the First Movers Coalition to talk to you all and, and share our story. For those of you that don't know EY, Ernst & Young House was a, a small professional services firm. I think we're at about 350,000 people now globally. Revenue is about billion, uh, $50 billion. In FY19, uh, which is our baseline year for our carbon ambition, uh, we spent uh, any over a billion dollars on airlines and hotels. That is a significant influence on both of those sectors. And then also a significant influence on sustainable avi aviation fuels, which maybe we'll come on to. But fundamentally, what made us have what we think is one of the most progressive carbon ambitions, carbon reduction plans in our industry. Well, obviously, there's a strong employee proposition there. We're one of the largest recruiters of people on campus. Younger people really care about this and they really hold you to account. That was definitely part of it. Like many of us, we've been compelled by governments and regulators to take positions to, and to be clear on our plans, uh, and that's a good thing. But actually, fundamentally, Annie, the business case behind this comes from actually many of you in the audience and, 
and CEOs like Martin and Henrik that our clients really demand this. You know, our emissions in serving many of you are your scope three emissions. And what we had at our global executive is many of our major clients asking us really clear questions on our carbon ambition reduction plans. Now, for all of us in the client or customer business, once your clients or customers care about something, you better care about it really quickly too. So the carbon ambition plan that we put together takes us from an FY19 baseline, a 40% reduction to our net zero position, agreed with SBTI, on 2025. That's leading in our industry. But then here's the difficult thing. During that same period, we'll nearly double the size of EY. So our challenge as partners, as leaders of the business, is, as ever, twofold and then plus one. The first one is living our values, living our purpose, keeping our culture together. The second is delivering on our growth ambitions. And then, Annie, we've made it a lot harder now for our people and our partners, because now we have to do both of those at the same time, significantly reducing our carbon emissions. That's a really tough thing. And I've said to my global board several times, you should have expected it to be tough because we wanted to be leaders in our industry. We're a simple business, just professional services. We don't manufacture anything. We don't make anything. We're a simple business. So if we can't do this and try and show the way, well then actually, I think we're gonna let down our clients, we're gonna let down our people, and we're gonna let down society. That's, that's the plan. That's great, that's, a, that's really inspiring. Uh, maybe Henrik, over to you. What made you all think about making uh, your commitment on aviation on steel? I will start at a slightly different place. Uh, we uh, we joined the first mover coalition uh, last year, but we probably practiced a few before we we did that. Um, but I will start a different uh, different place because we are blessed with probably having the world's most sustainable product, right? We manufacture a wind turbine uh, after approximately three and a half to four months life it goes carbon negative for the rest of its life. So in, in just around four months, it's basically eaten the negative uh, footprint and then we are rushing off and, and saving the world uh, in, in that sense. Uh, so coming end of 19, and I remember this, uh, we sat down and of course, as always, you, you give that and, and there is a little group that comes and present to the executive management and, and they tried second guessing because we were not very structured in all of this approach to sustainability. and. And, and I remember they all came and said, ah, oh, yeah, well, this is really good. And of course, they were second guessing that we wanted to have all of these nice pledges towards 2040. And that was going really well until um, somebody like me said, in 2040, you don't want me around. I'll probably at best be pushed around in a wheelchair. And at that point in time, I'm probably lucky if I can remember what I still name this. So we actually said, what is it that prevents us from just passing a baton and saying good luck? in somewhere in the 20s to the next leadership team and getting some of the things done. And, and, and of course, we fell into the scope one and two, which was pretty easy. And, and I'll tell you one thing, pretty easy, yes, right? Benefit class, anyone in here probably have heard about that expression and probably have one as well. So we said by end of 19, we said, bah, bah. we called the leadership team together and said, by the way, if you run out of the room now and just want to order the last diesel car, you don't need to come back. Because as of 1st of January, you only have the choice of these. And I remember it. It was interesting because there were only seven or eight models to choose from. A little bit of a, mm, but you have to live it. Three guys actually got up, ran out, said, Jesus Christ, you want to not come back? And they said, no, 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 Henrik, it's okay. We just wanted to cancel the free diesel cars. So I was like, okay, good, back in. But the interesting thing was when we took the decision to do it in the organization, we knew it had a cost effect of approximately 18% additional cost. Within the first six months of 20, those 18% were converted because the electrical vehicles were simply coming down the slope, so we were earning money on it. My point is just now, in every town hall, anyone up to around 40 was sort of saying, oh, that was about time, Henrik. From 40 to 55, and I can see now I'm touching a few in the room as well, 40 to 55 are saying, okay, yeah, well, we're going to stay here for a bit longer, so we probably just get over that uh, camp. And then what the one over 55 that said, oh, Jesus, we thought we could keep that car uh, long enough to, to live it through. My point is just, 
you have, as an ex executive leadership team, you have to make active choices. And if you are not willing to live it, you can't expect anyone else to live it. So that moved us into scope three, yeah. because scope three is somebody else's scope one. Yes. And, and, and for us, the only thing we base, we can recycle steel today, but that doesn't make it any easier. So therefore we said, we have to get to the steel because there is an approximately 2%, so the lifetime of the negative CO2 from the turbine, the 2% that starts off, that's the steel, and that's where we're going to work. And that, of course, means that we can go to at least two or three global partners and saying, how do we get to the green steel? Simple as that. And Henrik, if I could be a bit provocative, you know, you just gave the example of electric vehicles, which have a more obvious uh, lifetime cost benefit. But when you're talking about something like green steel, that's not necessarily going to pay itself back. So was that a harder, uh, a harder conversation, harder to get people on board to, to actually think about making that transformation towards green steel? We are the, um, we're the world's largest OEM uh, of turbines. And I think if you embark on the journey, then I think at some point in time, we will actually see that the technology will raise some of that uh, as well. So I think uh, that one, this is not about, and for the people that think that energy will be for free or, or anything, we have to stop that notion. It's a little bit like saying we forgot the premium of safe energy or security energy in Europe for a long time, and we were just reminded of that 24th of February. So it's an active decision making, and for that, you make choices. And the funny thing, I went to a few customers. Now they're actually competing about getting the first green steel towers. Yeah. Um, and then I've teamed up with another Swedish company that have convinced me to try to make wooden towers. And of course, the steel sort of good partners are not too uh, happy if that really proves too successful. So I think there's a couple of things going on parallel to each other here, which also makes it fun uh, to actually see that, how that will develop. That's, that's fantastic to hear. I look forward to seeing the first wood uh, turbine. That'll be interesting. You look almost like one of my engineers. Because, no, 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 no. <laughs> and uh, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. Well, Martin, there's a lot that you could talk about. Volvo has already really made major steps forward in terms of trying to meet your commitments. But can you take us to the beginning of that journey when Volvo decided to join the First Movers Coalition? <clears throat> no, I, I think I, I touched it uh, briefly, of course, in the introduction that uh, <clears throat> given that we uh, worked uh, uh, heavily with uh, the science-based targets, uh, how to think about that. I mean, uh, 90 plus is downstream uh, products in use for us uh, and a big proportion, of course, input material. Uh, and uh, when we started to l overlook where can we really work with methodology, with uh, cross-sectoral, uh, we found uh, FMC being very pragmatic in, in its uh, construct, a, a number of verticals. Uh, it's almost like a horse race on uh, the Tivoli, you know, where you're throwing balls and you can see uh, who is uh, doing progress, which is good. And, and also that we learn the methodology be, because we can apply that on so many other type of, uh, of verticals, right? And, and interesting enough, I mean, for us, 10% steel, uh, it is 75,000 ton per year today, approximately, I think, on a give and take, right? And it will grow, obviously, because we, by this we will take market share and logistics will increase. Uh, but still, we have secured 120,000 tons uh, by 2027, something like that. Meaning that when you get started and, and put the stick in the ground, things are happening. So the 10% is history. And now it's more about, okay, how do we continue to deploy that for other steel qualities? Aluminium Martin, is the same. If Martin has bought too much steel, I will take some of it early on. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't worry. But yeah. I'm, I'm sure I need yeah, to no. control what price he's bought. Yeah, that no, no, exactly, exactly. I, I, I will give you some of it for, for a small, for a small arbitrage. And, I knew that. Uh, no, no, but so aluminium steel is obvious for us. I mean, low hanging fruit. If you look at how it looks, also, I mean, uh, constructed and trucking, obvious. I mean, uh, in order to be a reliable, trustworthy, uh, committed partner to all our customers, we need to do the job ourselves. We need to understand what it takes. Uh, interesting enough, it is pretty hard to buy these solutions. And it's good to understand that also as the provider of the solutions, right? Uh, so so uh, it has been great uh, from, from that perspective. And, and to everyone's point here, uh, we see also how the whole organization and company is stepping up around it. Uh, you know, uh, the first deliveries that we've had, people are super proud, uh, want to do more. 
Uh, and also to do the calculation, I fully agree with Henrik, we are also one of the bigger players. And I, I think we will step up together with our peers also, because no one wants to be left behind, basically. So I, it's, it's fun. Absolutely. And I think. And by the way, uh, talking about turbines, yes. uh, scope one and scope two, uh, 2007, our biggest truck operations is in Ghent, Belgium. 2007, it became uh, net zero. Uh, actually, thanks to wind turbines. And that was pretty early days. Uh, and we were proud of that. And then we continue with other operations and also landfill free, obviously. So the scope one and scope two will rather soon be, uh, it, not history, but to be maintained. Scope three is uh, dash it. Yeah, scope, scope three is where the challenge is. This is really, I, I love listening to, to the three of you speak because I think the story that we're hearing is you have these individual companies who are stepping up maybe into a little bit of an unknown commitment, but then together in aggregate it, within each sector, you start to actually see that momentum. And that's exactly the theory of change for the First Movers Coalition, right? Aggregating that demand and then actually moving forward these green markets for innovative technologies. So it's, it's really exciting to hear about the way that this momentum is, uh, is being created. But uh, Steve, uh, Martin, I think you said something interesting, which is it's also difficult. Um, and, and I think that brings me to my next question, which is I would love to hear just a, a little bit of a frank discussion for, from the three of you of as you've been looking at these commitments, what have been some of the unexpected challenges or the challenges that uh, your peers should be aware they might face, that policymakers, that, um, that, that the actual producers of these goods should try and overcome? What are some challenges and, and what are some opportunities? Um, over to you. Uh, why don't we start off with this sustainable aviation fuel with the SAF discussion. Um, now, frankly, whilst we've made a progressive and, a, uh, and nearly aggressive statement on the amount of SAF that we need to have to deliver our carbon ambition, frankly, the challenge really is on the supply side. There's just not enough sustainable aviation fuel in the system. There's not enough capacity on manufacturing. There's not enough capacity on storage at major airports around the world. The infrastructure is not there. It needs a different type of tooling than Avro jet fuel than you have today. It's really difficult. Yeah. But if I go back to some numbers for you, so in FY19, we emitted 1.3 million tons of CO2, CO2 equivalent, 1.3 million tons. About 70% of that came from flying. Without having sustainable aviation fuel, we don't get to deliver our net zero commitment by 2025. That's important to us because our clients want it, our clients are asking for it, and our people, and the people yet to join us are asking for it as well. And one of the things that you'll know this because uh, Secretary Kerry talks about this a lot, is we feel we need to, alongside others in the coalition, the First Movers Coalition, give off the right market signals for demand. The more of us that can express a need, a commitment, use our procurement power, to give confidence to the producers of SAF, then also the infrastructure providers in airports, the more we'll get them to step forward and forward invest, because we're sli slightly helping them de-risk this. So Annie, I think part of this challenge that we see, part of the thing that we're so pleased about working with the First Movers Coalition on, is sending strong demand signals, strong market signals, so that manufacturers and others have the confidence to invest somewhat ahead of the curve because without their confidence, they don't invest in the right way, we don't get to meet our net zero commitments, and all of us, I think, won't get to play our role in making sure the planet doesn't heat up. Steve, I think we're going to take that clip and we're going to use it to describe the First Movers Coalition to everybody. <laughs> uh, Henrik, over to you. No, I, I think uh, falling into the trap in large organizations is always that you don't, you don't believe in your own success and you... And I think there, there is an enterprise arrogance in, in many large uh, organizations and, and, and I won't uh, shy away from that the pride is, is a, a very fine balance between pride and, and, and arrogance. I think having the guts and the confidence to accept that there are areas where you just don't have the solution opens up for, for, for both the innovation, you opens up for technology, uh, uh, welcoming that to solve uh, part of it. And then I think in the, in the other part of it is also be, be mindful of, it is about creating fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily only in the company, but also uh, outside. And then I think you need to sometimes, uh, yeah, I still remember we, as I said, we were part of creating CO2 neutral concerts, the first one in the, of its kinds in, in the world uh, last year. 
uh, it was uh, containerized truck batteries that was stored and other stuff, and everyone sort of go, mm -hmm. and and I remember the guy that came with the idea was the artist, yeah. and 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 on the Friday before the first concert, I, I said I'm not coming, uh, but call me if it works, so at least I know if there was light and music on, and and he phoned and he said that's 41 percent your engineers just told Lyft, so I said you have been a little scarce with your extra numbers then. <laughs> But it just shows that if we haven't listened to the guy, and I remember when we first time said it, the engineer said, that's the first time I'm going to test renewable energy through a battery to an electric guitar. But it worked, right? And, and today, he is the guy that, that, that motoring around and saying, that is doable. So, so, the, so the followship you can create, but still show that we didn't have the solution. Yeah. We, did, we didn't know, and, and I think that's, that's where a large organization can activate a lot of both confidence and pride and innovation and entrepreneurship. And sometimes we as large organizations forget that. Um, Fantastic. Uh, and Martin, I think this is the last question we'll have time for. I, I wish I could, you know, I could talk all day about this. I'm so impressed by what you're doing. I think there's so many lessons you all could share. I know uh, Secretary Carroll will be giving remarks shortly, but. Uh, maybe over to you to close out with some thoughts on the opportunities and challenges. No, no I can just uh, first and foremost agree with what has been said, but I think also not not a hurdle, but a challenge. We need to change our mindset how we look upon the relations in the supply chain. In many sectors, that has been rather transactional. It has been rather, you know, uh, sitting and playing cards with each other. That mm. era is over. We need to connect uh, in many different steps in the supply chain. Uh, the semiconductor that has nothing to do with this is actually another proof point that it was a failure, not only due to the shortage of supply, but the shortage of transparency. But with this way of working, uh, we actually are driving the transparency in the supply chain to get the job done together. Because when uh, Martin Lindqvist from SSAB got the demand signal from us, got the demand signal from Henrik and some other key customers, uh, and we started to leave it eight months after we took the decision to go for fossil free steel. We delivered the first product, the first dump truck and the first autonomous truck. And they moved forward with their investment plan of ramping up uh, their steel mills uh, in this project with um, between five and eight years in that value chain, not only mm -hmm. SSAB, but also when it comes to uh, the mining of LKB and also then the, 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 um, uh, the energy supply from Vattenfall. So th that shows that the whole story of working in these verticals is driving a cooperation in the value chain, and that will drive the delivery of the science-based targets of the scope three that everyone wants to avoid now, but it, we have to go there, and that is the force of the FMC. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. And it's great to land, to, to finish on that example of a really tangible way that we drove forward the market. Thank you all for your collaboration, the FMC, and the great work that you're doing. This has been really great. And as I already announced, we have a very special guest and friend here uh, with us now, and that is uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, who is the founder, uh, together with the UF, of this initiative. We are proud to be one of the founding partners, but the founder and the ID, and also the advocate and uh, really the driver of this initiative. So, uh, John, please, if you can give some also remarks about what is happening. As you know, we are talking about here the initiative that is one of the key initiatives for this year. Uh, uh, the second pillar in our, uh, in our house about uh, surfacing supply. Uh, we, together with we, EY, will actually share then the, the CPU summit in order to surface that demand. So, uh, great to have you here. Thank you. So, you've announced the summit? Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to do anything. I'll see you later, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martin, thank you so very much. Thank you, all of you. Um, <laughs> this is so dangerous I have learned in public life to show up somewhere and you don't have a clue what anybody said and you speak. Uh, it is really dangerous. Uh, but that said, um, I do have a clue about what this is all about and what we're trying to do, as Martin knows. Um, folks, it's funny, as I go around to various events here, I just came from one where we did a session, uh, public session, and, uh, of course, the question is asked, 
how many of you believe that we will get to keeping 1.5 degrees by 2030 and so forth? Um, and most hands didn't go up. But we had a long discussion uh, about where we are and what is happening. And I think at the end, we persuaded probably half the audience that we're going to get there, sort of a leap of faith. I know we can get there. There's no question about that. But it depends entirely on us, on the decisions we make, the things we're willing to do over the course of the next seven years. Now, <clears throat> we have a brave group uh, of really smart, creative, visionary CEOs. Uh, and obviously, their whole value chain of personnel within their companies, you know, COOs and everybody else, who have come together saying, you know what, we got to do our part to try to help accelerate this transition. And what we're finding is that as we send a demand signal through the marketplace, whether it's for green steel or green cement or shipping, converting to, uh, you know, converting to uh, carbonless propulsion and so forth, there are so many ways that people can make a difference here to accelerate the transition. Now, frankly, uh, you may pay a premium now, but by being first in the market, you're going to have a share, whatever that's going to be, and you will be the pathfinders, and people will have confidence and trust, and you can also market it, to be honest with you, uh, because a lot of people are going to be looking in their value chains for the ability to be able to have their scope one, scope two, scope three taken care of. And, and people are going to be deciding where to go locate and where to do a business based on their capacity to fulfill their ESG slash uh, you know, uh, environment goals. So I have confidence. I mean, I think this, you know, it's a little scary for some of these CEOs. They're stepping up and stepping out, but it's happening. The partner of uh, Volvo is Amazon. Not a, not a small partner to have, by the way, not bad. Uh, and trucks are being delivered now that are going to be making a difference. Uh, steel is coming in to a company that is carbonless or at a level that's acceptable and near fully green, if not green. And, and there's an ability, and, and Volvo stepped up and said, yeah, we're going to do 10%. 10% of the steel that we buy is going to be fitting this category, which sends a signal to a lot of other players that uh, there's a virtue uh, to doing this. Now, I think the as it's happening, people are finding, you know, other folks within the procurement chain to be able to bring in and, and, and this will get bigger faster, I think. We had a meeting yesterday with many of the 70 CEOs. We now have 70 companies. And by the way, they're not small companies. They're pretty significant entities. When you start getting FedEx and United Airlines and Delta and uh, you know, Volvo and, uh, you know, Lafarge Folsom and uh, 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 Lafarge Holson and a whole uh, group of different players, including shippers. I was talking to a fellow the other day, he, uh, not a fellow, he's one of the Maersk family, uh, and uh, he was talking about how their AI is now being applied to what they're doing and new propulsion. And so they've got a certain number of ships that are already proving you can be, you know, on the right side of the carbon factor and still be shipping. Shipping, if it were a country, as you know, would be the eighth largest emitter in the world. So it is not an insignificant effort to try to get out there and, uh, and, and make this transition. Um, I think that uh, we want to try to grow it. We need to grow this effort. I think that can happen CEO to CEO far more effectively than John Kerry to CEO or some other person. Um, but uh, even though yesterday, I can't remember who it was, but somebody introduced me and said, uh, you're my president of the world. <laughs> so that's the best title I've ever had, you know, having striven hard to just get part of that title. Um, but. Um, the bottom line, folks, is this. We don't win this battle unless the private sector is all in. 
Do we just don't? And yes, we need government. Government to do what we did with the IRA, set the structure, create the incentives, invite people in. We're not picking winners, we're not picking losers, but we're giving everybody the opportunity to play. And the marketplace is going to decide who's going to win here. And I think most CEOs, most people in the world should appreciate that this is not command and control. It's, it's sort of, you know, an opportunity that is granted by virtue of a need that has to be accomplished. World War II, when we knew we needed to gain control of the skies and control of the sea and so forth, we took a Ford Motor Company production facility in Libertyville, Michigan, turned it into an airplane factory, and by, you know, near the end of the war, we were turning out one B-24 every single hour. We need to turn out solar panels at that rate, to be honest with you. And we need to be deploying them at a faster rate and, and putting far more emphasis on what the First Movers Coalition is doing. And I think President Biden is geared to try to do that in these next months. We're going to have another summit of the Major Economies Forum. Uh, we're talking with the Chinese now. We think we can sort of break the ice there a little bit and, uh, and, and, and hopefully find a way to show the world that we're going to cooperate together to do some things that will make a difference, that will send a signal to the marketplace. This is serious business. So let me just, I don't need to go on and on and on at all. I, I just want to emphasize to all of you, you're out there out front in the creation of a new way for people to think about their business, and particularly procurement. And there's a lot, I'm glad you're going to do the procurement, because that's really where a lot of this can happen. Purchase of your fleets or purchase of certain materials, or whatever they are, can really have an impact here. But don't for a minute worry that you're going to get left in the trail of this market transition because it is happening. It's not going to stop. People are seized by this issue now. I've been at this since the 1980s, and I have seen the currents. I know what the headwinds are. Uh, I've been out there proselytizing when nobody's listening, or we have a very antagonistic group of people listening. That's vanishing. What is there now are a whole bunch of folks who realize we're in a race against time. And unless we get that 45% reduction in emissions minimum by 2030, it is really hard, if not impossible, to hit net zero by 2050, which, by the way, most companies don't have a clue how they're going to do. So we got to be honest with each other. What we're doing is pushing the curve, pathfinding, uh, and you all can be on the front lines of that. And I hope you will feel confident about uh, the way we're headed. Ford Motor Company and General Motors and Volvo have all spent a lot of money to retool factories and to retool production lines, and they're gonna produce electric vehicles. Not gonna go back. By 2035, we in the United States anticipate only building electric vehicles. No more new ICE vehicles. They'll, they'll sell the ones that are still there at an incredible discount, and hopefully there'll be a recycling process that can take them in before too long, and, off we go in a circular economy. But for the moment, this is, uh, I think, the boldest moment that I have personally witnessed in this journey uh, at any time, at any previous uh, WEF, or at any previous time in the day-to-day -day business of our countries. So I congratulate you, I thank you, I invite you to be as bold as you can, to reach out, bring other companies to this table. And you watch how fast everything accelerates at that point. There's a point where this is going to become second nature to people. And they're going to want it because people are demanding it. So uh, second biggest voting issue in our election this year, which was a surprise to all of us, that, you know, who were dreading the worst. But people came out, and mostly young people. And young people, the second largest issue, the most important issue in that election was climate. So it's a voting issue now, and that's also going to make a difference. So everybody, God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great New Year. Stay safe. There is still COVID around. <laughs>
And, uh, but I think we're going to beat the odds on everything if we stay on track. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. Uh, thank you, dear Jon, for your leadership. Uh, it's very inspiring to listen to you. And we will now continue uh, with uh, Fireside, uh, led by uh, Nancy, who is also uh, leading this initiative from the WEF side, uh, instrumental together with Julia, then from uh, Breakthrough Energy. So I leave the floor to you for the next session. Thank you very much. It's always been a dream of mine to follow Secretary Kerry. This is <laughs> phenomenal. So, um, as was stated, I'm Nancy Gillis. I'm actually the program head for the First Movers Coalition at the World Economic Forum. We're super excited to actually serve as the secretariat for the First Movers Coalition. Um, and we are also very excited not only to have the United States as the initiating partner, but to now be at 12 governments who are actually partners in the First Movers Coalition. And as was mentioned, we're out to 70 companies having started uh, with our launch with about 35 or so. Um, but we're speaking today because it's not only the companies that are important to the First Movers Coalition, it's not only the government and the government partners, but it's also one of our major implementation partners, Breakthrough Energy. And so I'm super glad to have this conversation with you, Julia. What we are thinking about is, of course, leveraging the demand signal, right? And as Secretary Kerry mentioned, as Martin did as well, we are planning a Procurement Innovation Summit. So take this away from this session, a Procurement <laughs> Innovation Summit. I appreciate the shout out, the woohoo from Annie, because she knows. <laughs> My background is in procurement, and as I have been quoted as saying, it might not be sexy, but it is impactful, tremendously so. And it's really how, when we talk about these demand commitments, at the end of the day, that's how credibly they will be implemented, because that's what we're talking about. Scope three is your engagement with your suppliers. And what does that engagement look like? It looks like contracts. It looks like that unsexy, but incredibly impactful activity of really investing in a different way of doing. And so, Julie, if you could talk a little bit about, because I know we've connected, you too very much understand the power of demand and also how that looks in procurement. You're very active with all the things that you've done in your own career, so you might want to take a moment just to let the audience know. But at this juncture, you're also very active in green procurement. So if you could talk a little bit about why is Breakthrough Energy an implementation partner for the First Movers Coalition? Why is demand aggregation important if we haven't had enough of those examples? Mm -hmm. But really, we're planning a procurement summit. What's the power of procurement? And what are you experiencing from a public procurement perspective as well? So first of all, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, um, Martin, for inviting me. Um, in a nutshell, I think if you were to characterize Breakthrough Energy, we're sort of the clean technology suppliers, right? And um, for those who aren't familiar, we were set up by Bill Gates in 2015. And we're all about how do we scale, how do we develop the technologies that we need to reach net zero, but equally to meet affordability objectives that we have. So front and center, the innovations, Martin, that we were talking about, the technologies that we need across all of the sectors to decarbonize is essentially what our bread and butter is about. We've been, uh, we have an investment uh, vehicle called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, and that fund has over 100 portfolio companies. And those are sort of companies that are at the avant-garde of, of developing the breakthroughs that we need to reach net zero. And we qualify that first in terms of impact, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, half a gigaton of CO2 at scale. So we're really talking about the solutions that matter for, for our net zero transition. Now, none of those technologies will get to scale and none of those companies will get to scale if you don't have an off taker, right? Of course, you need the financing, you need the regulation to work right, but you equally need the demand. And this is where First Movers Coalition is such an important partner and why we've been there together from the start. 
it involves sort of conversations, of course, around, well, what is a breakthrough? How do you define green steel? How do you define green cement? Sustainable aviation fuels. And so we've been part of those conversations, really sort of at the vanguard of what we see as a breakthrough, right? Being able to challenge what the First Movers Coalition is sort of suggesting might be green, might be a breakthrough. That has been very much important to us, is sort of defining the global standards, first of all, of how do you define these products, right? What is the market going to buy? The second element is really around, well, you need to, 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 to bring those, mar those new technologies, those companies to scale. And this is where, again, the power of procurement is so important. And I think a point that Martin made is the importance of this value chain collaboration. We have a lot of technology companies that some of them are sort of still emerging. And this is where first movers and the supply um, procurement sort of conversation becomes important because we can't wait till 2050, and we can't wait for these long development cycles to happen. We need these conversations to happen early between the procurers and between the technology providers in order to leapfrog, right? Same, we also have a number of companies, but also we're working with a lot of other uh, venture funds that also have companies that are ready to be scaled today. But in the case, just for example, of Green Steel, an area where I'm working a lot on, a lot of these final investment decisions have not been made. And so this is where it's so important to have a procurer at the table. We're, we're seeing, for example, H2 Green Steel, whom, whom some of you might be familiar with. You know, they're not yet even starting construction or might be close to, and yet over half of their supply is, 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 is already in, under contract. Another example that we see where that collaboration with the value chain comes even further is another um, example of Gravity, which is again a provider here of green steel or the intermediary product. And here you already have the off-takers that are strategic investors. These are the types of model that are so important. You come back now to the question of, of, of green public procurement, and indeed we've been working with the Stockholm Environment Institute, we've been working with the industry, with the IDDI, which is an effort of joint of governments to really give that signal. Same thing, you know, again, in cement, concrete, in steel, those markets represent very large shares of volumes. And so it's very important to get those signals again in order to reach final investment decision, to convince essentially that these technologies are ready to be scaled, to fast track that, but equally this joint, partners, this joint um, partnership that can happen between the First Movers Coalition and the governments on the procurement side, because again, we're never going to reach our targets if we don't start to work collaboratively together. No, and I, I appreciate you making that tie between it is incredibly important to have the first movers who are CEOs, right? But there is a reason that we also have our government partners, because when you're starting to create a demand signal, especially for some of the hard to abate sectors that we're focused on, such as cement and concrete, more than half of cement and concrete demand is right now through governments, right? So if you really want to even support the investment and uh, the risks that CEOs who are first movers are taking, we need to go ahead and leverage governments as much as we can. Absolutely. So we're super excited about that. And if I may, I think there's also the, the importance of having governments at the table, because if we're going to fast track all of these investments that need to happen, you need to fast track the permitting, you need to fast track the, the, the descriptions of what are standards. I mean, there's, there's so much that needs to happen in, in all, of, all of this together at some point in order to be able to get these final investment decisions. So the power of public procurement, absolutely, but also the power of sort of working together to make sure that we're in a fast track mode and leapfrogging. Absolutely. And, and moving on to the, and I know we also have a great example of how power of procurement is working in Volvo Group, so I want to make sure that we have that as well. But we hear, and Secretary Kerry reminded us, we're still in the time of COVID, right? Uh, we know very much that uh, with the UK invasion, what we have is an energy emergency. We're talking here about taking risks and moving forward. We heard from the panel that Annie did a great job in moderating why the CEOs are moving forward with first movers, but there's a lot on their plate. And part of what Breakthrough Energy is looking at from you know, the global perspective that you have is when you're looking at climate change and addressing climate change, what should be the focus? We're very appreciative that you're in the First Movers Coalition, but do you have any guidance just from that purview that you have of what should the CEOs be focusing on now? 
That's a great question, and, and I think we're, we're soon out of time, so I'll be very brief. But I think that the energy crisis and, of course, the, the tragic Ukraine war and in, in situation in, in which we're in has highlighted the dependencies in which we're in toward, with regards to fossil fuel. And I think if there's one thing that can happen, the silver lining of, of, of this situation is really fast-tracking our way out of these fossil fuel dependencies. And I think what we've been looking at, as with other partners, is essentially how can you address short-term these immediate needs to substitute um, natural gas with other op opportunities? How do you reduce demand? And so we've done an exercise of looking at the portfolio companies and working again with other investors in this space to understand what are the technologies, what are the companies that can fast track both that substitution and that emission reduction potential, as well as, of course, um, the, the energy demand that we need. So we've looked at this from the perspective of how, um, how, how, how can these companies, how fast are they ready to market? How can they, how can they sort of build up their first of a kind uh, projects? And we know that there are a number that, that can lead to that. The second is cost, of course. I know that cost is, is important, even though you can off, the, off take those from, from companies that want to be uh, first movers in decarbonizing their scope three emissions. And then the third is the impact. How can we look at this in terms of energy, uh, um, energy resilience, essentially off taking our resilience? And so uh, we see a lot of opportunities, if you will, through this again, an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate crisis and unfortunate war to catalyze a lot of investment decisions uh, and, and fast track. Again, I cannot sort of amplify again. There's a lot of this new tech frontier, the IEA says it, many others, that is ready to scale, and now's the time. So again, if there's a silver lining in how we can all work towards combining both our energy resilience and the climate crisis is now through, through these type of work. And it's the First Movers Coalition who is actually capitalizing on that availability of those innovative new clean technologies and using the commitment of first mover companies such as Volvo Group and Vestas and Wholesome as well to really have your demand pull them forward. But we say that. And how does that really happen? And I think this is a great transition. How does it really happen? So let me hand it off to one of the, and I will say, I love procurement, so I track this. One of the best forward-leaning, powerful procurement representatives in the field today, if I may. Thank you very much. And today I don't come alone. I brought with me my dear friend and colleague, Lars Denkvist who is the CTO of Volvo Group. So I would like to start to set a little bit the scene for Volvo Group. The need of, for transport is increasing with growing population, growing consumption of goods. And with that, our industry will make a bigger impact. And we know as well that this is the deciding decade to make sure that we don't pass irreversible tipping points. At Volvo Group we are very sure and we have realized that we are up against the biggest challenge in our industry ever. The good news is that we can reduce emissions to net zero if we use the right technologies and innovations. This calls, of course, for a shared responsibility, good cooperation in, with different partners in the value chain, but it calls as well for a great collaboration of purchasing and engineering teams at each company. And you know, going fossil free then is, uh, as Andrea said, it's the biggest challenge to our industry ever then. And uh, when we saw this coming five, six years yes. ago, the reality that we operated within was, I dare to say, rather stable. Uh, we were used to incremental development steps, well-known technologies, small steps every year, low risks. Uh, it was okay to work in sequence. 
My engineers, they finalized the design. In our closed rooms, we were writing heavy specifications, uh, defining exactly what, what we wanted to buy. Then we handed it over to your team, Andrea, and you started to identify suppliers and the procurement process started. And then we nominated suppliers. It was sequential, it was slow. Yeah. Uh, we were also very secret. I mean that we were working with development that was kept as a very, very confidential secret. And uh, that means that we were not that open to listen in to what was available. And when we finally were ready with our design, then we always ended up with a lot of customization according to our needs, which didn't help us being faster. So we were slow, low risk, rather predictable, Andrea. But we have changed a lot, if not completely upside down. A lot has changed since then. And uh, I think that the proof point that we have right now, Martin has been into it, we are early out with electric vehicles, buses, construction machines, and trucks. And we wouldn't have been that early. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have been the pioneers in North America and in Europe if we would have stayed working in the old way, Andrea. I fully agree. So we were early out with battery electric trucks, vehicles in general. But when the volume is increasing, something is happening. Of course, tailpipe emission is reduced, but the carbon footprint for the purchased material, for purchased services, is increasing. Not only in relation, also in absolute figures. And this is the case because we use more carbon intense material. So this is the reason why we at Volvo Group have said there is no time to wait. We have to start now to also reduce the carbon footprint of our whole supply network. And what we need then is much more innovations at a much higher pace. It's a completely different landscape today. And uh, we are not linear anymore. It's not incremental anymore. It is disruptive to bonus. And uh, it's a big difference. We have much more technologies in parallel. We go on combusting engines for renewable fuels. We introduce battery electric vehicles. We will introduce fuel cell electric vehicles. We are adding a lot of technologies that we don't master today. So we are also going, I dare to say, Andrea, from low risk to high risk. And all this means that we cannot do this on our own. We need to team up. We need to find the best partners in the world in the entire value chain. We need to be much more open to listening in what is available. There is no way to work in a sequence anymore, Andrea. Absolutely, and I think, Lars, you and I, we anyhow work closely together, but it's also true for our teams. And of course, we invite our supply partners early on, as you have said. So really taking responsibility already at sourcing decisions. So how do we do that to take this on in sourcing decisions? Well, now we are starting to really calculate the ratio cost per CO2 tons saved. So we consider CO2 like we consider costs in our decisions. But we cannot succeed alone. So it is key that we take our supply partners with us with clear decarbonization targets and everyone is working to the same game. But it's not enough just to talk about targets. We have to come into action. It's true. And what we have defined as our success factors so far has been to be much more open than before. And I mean that we are working with development cannot be a secret. What we want to achieve cannot be a secret. We need to have partners, and we have identified partners in all directions of the value chain. Of course, with our supply partners, but also with our customers and with our customers' customers. And in some cases, even with our competitors. 
For example, setting up the joint venture together with our main competitor, Daimler Trucks, when it comes to developing and producing fuel cell systems. This shows how much the landscape has changed. We need to involve everyone much earlier. We need to listen much more uh, to understand what is available. And if something is available, we are much more keen on using those kind of standard solutions in order to get to a more speedy solution. So Andrea, we are also now then much more used to nominate suppliers much earlier even without having finalized specifications. And this is a big game changer and sometimes almost a little bit scary, but uh, this is the only way to go. To hook arms together with those ones that really want to do the change. And then down the road, you will just find the solutions together. And we see a lot of interest at our supply partners to work with us, to discuss with us, and to go with us on this journey because it is a super exciting journey to be on. So I can only recommend the ones who are not on this journey yet join because it is now the right time to do so. It is clear that still we have a lot to do at Volvo Group, but also in the whole ecosystem. It would be great if, and we heard this already, if more companies would have science-based targets, because then we know we are going to the right directions. I said it before, ambitious and targets are worth nothing if we don't come into actions. And you know, being a, a partner in the First Movers Coalition, uh, we, we really have seen it is inspirational and it has proven to be very successful. I know Nancy you will like to hear that but this is actually the absolute truth. Sustainability is not only the right thing to do, this is where now the business growth is. So also and also uh, Secretary Carey was in that, you should not be afraid that you are in the right business area. We see that the First Movers Coalition really creates a collective demand for decarbonizing technologies. But we also need, of course, and it was said before, we need our governments to enable speed of transformation needed. In our example, it is having access to renewable energy, access to charging infrastructure, access to the right grid capacity. The private and the public sector have to work together with synchronized agendas. So to conclude, we really strongly encourage everyone who has not already joined to onboard this journey taking responsibility for the world we and future generations want to live in. We want, with our discussion today, to inspire and motivate purchasing and engineering teams to work closely together to make purposeful decisions. Imagine just the impact we have if we work together. The climate crisis is such a big challenge. No one can do it alone. So let's take action now together. Thank you. Thank you. Such great colleagues here, you can uh, not fail. So uh, as you can imagine, I have a great, great job to have such fantastic team. And there are many of them. We also have uh, our Minister of uh, Environment here from Sweden. Sweden is actually one of the partner countries also in the coalition. So I will leave the word to you for some final remarks also. What uh, have you heard? What can we do together? And thank you for coming as well.
I'm actually going to take the opportunity and sit down and have a good reflection on what we've heard so far. It's been very interesting. And first of all, just thank you for the opportunity to join. I'm proud to see Volvo and three other Swedish companies being part of the uh, FMC. And um, it was great hearing uh, Lars mentioning uh, the opportunities that come of business to business collaboration, because B2B is crucial to improve the life cycle impact of products. And that is actually key to reaching net zero objectives. So it's truly great to hear what collaborations you've um, developed within, within different businesses, putting competitiveness aside and maybe looking at the broader perspective of competitiveness and the opportunities that come of developing sustainable ways of, of, uh, of working. And in our role as government partners, we strive to bring on more leading Swedish and other countries' uh, companies to engage, both in discussions and in implementation of uh, public policy, and in accelerating the technological development and innovations. And uh, the public sector truly has to show the way. And I've heard a few of you mention it today, but public procurement is an effective uh, instrument for promoting innovative and climate smart solutions. And uh, for example, innovation procurement uh, has a great potential to contribute to reduce emissions. Sweden is also a member of uh, Clean Energy Ministerial's Industry Deep Decarbonization Initiative, which is difficult to pronounce, but <laughs> Uh, an important part in encouraging governments to buy green steel and cement. And um, I would like to thank the US and the WEF for taking FMC forward. It's exciting to see that we are truly now at the stage of climate transition where this kind of initiative is reality. It's uh, not a longer a matter of when, it's a matter of how, and also specifically how fast. Because, uh, well, as you know, the, the part of it being quickly is, is of utmost importance. And we all know the urgency that is dominating our climate crisis. It is not going fast enough, and nothing is a better incentive than the many reports. And I'm thinking, for example, of IMF's World Economic Outlook that shows that the economic future that lies ahead of us and the profits that will come out of a quick and true adaptation towards sustainability. And they are big. Those profits are, uh, are truly what lies ahead. And if you'd like to, you can collect the breadcrumbs of the fossil dependent economy. You truly can, but they are to be non-existent in the near future. And investing in that sustainable future will come with big profits. And um, well, FMC is one of around 60 international initiatives that Sweden is a member of. So we are truly uh, aiming at accelerating global uh, climate action globally. And for us, it is key to ensure that the landscape of initiative addresses key challenges and opportunities across value change. Um, and we believe that the FMC has a valuable role in that, in um, showing the uh, building on the demand of the market and complementing more policy-oriented initiatives such as Lead It and Glasgow Breakthroughs. And to speed up the green transition at scale, we truly need cooperation and collaboration, as a lot of you have mentioned today. And, you know, to work efficiently and to make the best of our resources, we need to fill the gaps and include relevant stakeholders from north to south. And that is an important part looking ahead. The Lead its summit statement from COP27 stressed the need to mobilize and guide investments in the industry transition. And this focus area for Lead It in 2023 will help to meet the demand by FMC members. Additionally, our sense is that the initiatives are also complementing the UNFCCC process. Increasing focus on implementation is truly the part of the green transition that we are in now. And anything that can accelerate that is really of importance. So, you know, getting things done, in short. And I think that's been kind of a, uh, something to mention as a concluding remark. This, uh, this can truly be something to also uh, be reflected at at COP28. How are we doing in getting things done? Because it truly is, is time for that. And finally, FMC is a clear example of the opportunities that come with climate action. Urgency and opportunity are the main Swedish messages for climate action globally. And urgency as proven by science and opportunity proven by the new jobs and the economic growth that the transition truly brings. And through FMC and other channels, 
Let's jointly make sure that more partners globally can embrace the opportunities that come of climate action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rumina. Great to have you here. I will be very, very brief now just saying that uh, thank you for uh, actually bearing with us a little bit of overdraft. Uh, I think it was worth it. We were standing here in May, actually, uh, with the same theme. We were early days then with the, with the coalition. And uh, as a matter of fact, I quoted then one of my predecessors, Gunnar Engelau, uh, and uh, that reminds me, uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, Prince Daniel, that I quoted that at the same time when you were inaugurating uh, the Camp X Innovation Arena uh, that has been one of the successful, actually, uh, tools for us to bring in different type of innovative partners, not at least startups uh, that are on the edge of technology where we are co-inventing. And uh, I dare to say that I can utilize that today as well because I love that quote. Uh, since we see what has happened in only these uh, two, uh, three, four quarters, actually three quarters since we last met, we have delivered quite uh, significantly. Uh, as he said, uh, I take the hat off for everything that has been achieved, but I take the jacket off and uh, roll up the sleeves for the future. So let's continue with that execution. Thank you for coming, everyone, and thank you for uh, leading the way. Thanks a lot.